I've been really lucky. You know, I worked in the banking industry s- selling derivatives to hedge funds, right? So these are the mega trend of finance, the mega trend of derivative, and the mega trend of hedge funds. So I, mm. you know, I was doing pretty well. You know, at 30 years yeah. old, I was earning, earning more than a million dollars a year. Um, so, yeah, But you I managed was, to walk away from that, which is pretty impressive. Yeah, and I, I first went to a hedge fund. Don't forget. So I left Goldman, went to hedge funds. So I took a risk. Yep. But I, I used to argue with my boss every time. He used to give me share options and uh, restricted stock. I'm like, thank you. It's worthless. I'd rather have cash. Because how dare you? You should be proud to have equity in Goldman. And that's why we can give you so much more compensation. I said, it's worthless. He said, why do you say that? I said, because it's not money I can spend. So he got really pissed off with me. And then when I finally quit to go to my biggest customer and the biggest customer of Goldman's equity derivative uh, uh, equity desk and the equ- entire equity floor in Europe, uh, GLG Partners. He then called me into his office and goes, "Ral, you were dead right. It was worthless." He said, "So I lost it all. Um, I managed <laughs> to cash in some of it, but I lost millions of dollars to make that move. But I oh, wanted wow. to make that move because I wanted to see whether I could, if I could run money myself." and be a macro investor, because it was another chapter that I wanted to pursue for my own goals. Is a full-blown crypto rally imminent? Will Bitcoin and Ethereum rise once again and reach new all-time highs? According to the macro investor and crypto guru Raul Paul, market conditions are mimicking previous bull run and the price action of the crypto market is signaling bullish times ahead. Recently, Raul Paul told his Twitter followers that the crypto market is currently mirroring March of 2020, which was during the early phase of the COVID-19 pandemic when asset prices crashed before staging a strong recovery. Also, Raul shares his take on NFTs, building portfolio with cryptocurrencies and the network effects. But seeing the current market conditions and the economic turmoil due to Russia-Ukraine conflicts, this prediction may seem a bit questionable. Hello and welcome to Money Talks. In today's video, Raul Paul talks about his career from a hedge fund manager to the CEO of Real Vision, how he 10x'd his money with crypto, why NFTs are a bubble, winning the game of life, and more. If you like the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and turn on the post notifications. Let's dive right into the video. The the average person is seeing is a different breakthrough that came out of this whole concept. Is in digital world, everything that gets digitized goes to zero in value or cost. Everything, right? The price of data, the price of everything is zero over time. So that's a big problem if you're (laughs) living in an increasingly digital world. So how do you cement digital value is you have to introduce a system of scarcity. And an NFT allows a digital asset to have scarcity. Okay, breakthrough. Now, it could have come from the music industry. It could have come from a number of different places. It ended up being the art market. Mm. Okay. And where you can say... This stuff that was now was basically worthless online. I mean, Getty had bought a bunch of image rights, but to police it is really bloody hard as well. So, okay, now we can create a one of one of value or a number and do that. So that becomes the value of an NFT. The next part of an NFT that you say, okay, well, if we give a bunch of people these, we can now identify a community. And then these people can be like-minded communities because they coalesce around an idea, which is this piece of art and this community, which is Bored Ape Yacht Club or Crypto Punks. So that becomes incredibly valuable. It's a membership to a club and it's your identification. It's showing your Rolex and, you know, it's all of that stupid identifying tribal stuff that humans do endlessly and always have and always will. So that's going on and it allows us, don't forget the internet had taken us from our towns, villages, families, which is our social structure, and thrown us into a big shouting room from people all around the world with different views, right? It's quite exhausting. And we all wanted a place. And what this is giving us is 
these little digital communities, sovereign states, villages, towns, cities, where we can now operate with civically minded people within that. And these tokens are the identifiers. Social tokens are the big thing. They're, they're not, com they've only just started. That's much bigger, I think, than even NFTs are. But let's start with this, because this is a way of coalescing humans, because humans like these kind of identification, system of shared values, that kind of stuff. So NFTs are a lot of things. That's why they're so big. And again, that's just scratching the surface of what this is. It's your, it can also and will also be your digital identity online. So what is the world's most vibrant communities? It's sports and it's culture. That's fashion, brands, fashion brands more than any others. Um, it's music, it's art, it's these things, right? Culture. The big unlock here is if you can tokenize communities, which is now the network owner is the same as the network user. Remember that Facebook example? Right. So now we've got pop star and token holder. They're all now joined in the same network. So now everybody's incentivized to grow the value of that network. You've now made culture and investment. This was not possible. You could take a cultural marker like an Adidas sneaker, but you weren't making money from Adidas. You had to buy the shares. And there was no connection between the consumers. There was no network of Adidas users. Now you're about to create networks amongst these people. So what is the value of LVMH, the fashion company, mm. right? With all of its kind of mega brands that people are passionate about that are status symbols that humans like we've just talked about love these things. So the same with music, right? We're all tribal in music. We love different music. We like different bands. So to be part of that network, I could now be a 16-year-old kid and never have to have a job because I happen to get involved in the right. I'm good at finding the next pop star. But right. if I buy their social tokens <laughs> or I invest in their song IP on NFTs, right, I'm in business. So what this is creating is a system I think is universal basic equity where culture is the investment. They're not living in your and I world where they're building businesses and having to sell them and go through the entrepreneur's miserable journey. Um, they don't have to do that. They do a different way, which is by using their human instincts about the communities they want to be part of and which networks are going to thrive. And music is so powerful because it's human emotion. Um, and people, and it's, it's a place in time. And I remember I'm, Huge music fan, and you know, I identify music by its year, what I was doing, what it smelled like, what I heard, who I was hanging out with. I mean, everything, right? right? M music is is one of those anchoring things. So, just the ability for musicians to now sell directly and have a direct relationship with their fans via social tokens and NFTs is literally a game changer. Every society is the same. So, if we think of everything as the same. So let's assume Bitcoin is a social token, Ethereum is a social token, let's assume the US dollar is a social token, and let's assume that um, religion is a social status token, essentially. So everybody goes the same way to increase the value of that thing. So the US is like, we've got military might and we're the greatest nation, this is the free place and everybody can become a president, right? That's their right. narrative. Right. Every country has a different narrative to drive its value system for its network because they all require incoming capital to support right. the network, including the church, which couldn't right. have survived without incoming capital. So they get all these people out to go and tell the word of God. They then spread the, the dish around, take money in. It builds the church. It grows the network. They're all the same. That's humans. Right. The, the book Sapiens kind of goes through this a lot about how humans need to self-organize. The global macro guru Raul Paul also says that while in March 2020, the concern was the economic shutdown as a result of the pandemic, the risks now include high inflation, surging oil prices, potential interest rate increases, and a contradictory monetary policy or quantitative tightening, or QT. Back then, Bitcoin turned up 10 days before the NASDAQ 100 index, but bonds led crypto. Cut to today, 8% inflation, oil at new highs, seven hikes priced in, plus QT with Goldman Sachs calling for 11 hikes and a war. Crypto failed to make new lows. According to Paul, 
The crypto price action is signaling that digital assets could be positively impacted by the macroeconomic environment. And this is the time to watch carefully. Paul also says that bond yields are currently signaling that economic growth is likely to slow down significantly, while the sell-off of tech stocks could conclude soon. So what are your thoughts about NFTs? Are NFTs a scam or a digital bubble? Tell us in the comments. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you soon with the next video. Thank you so much for watching.